All right, hello everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of Conversations with a Pro Trader. I'm your host, Greta Wall, and I'm joined today by Scott Redler. Scott is the tr Chief Strategic Officer at T3 Live. He's a professional trader with T3 Trading Group and also the moderator of T3 Live's Alpha Team Virtual Trading Floor. And thanks so much for joining us today, Scott. Well, thanks for having me. How are you today? I'm doing great and I'm excited about this conversation that we're gonna have today for our audience. But first, let's start off with you, Scott. Introduce yourself to everyone. Tell us how long you've been trading overall, how long you've been with T3, how you got involved with T3. I know a little bit about this story, but just give us the Cliff Notes version so everyone can know who you are. I was about to say, how much time do we have? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'll give you the quick and dirty. So I started trading in 1998. I started at Broadway Trading. Um, I traded through the tech bubble bursting in the year 2000. We had about, I don't even know how many traders. We had probably 800. Everyone thought it was a get rich type of situation. And then boom, just like that, the NASDAQ bubble burst. By 2002, our group was like 30 guys. Then like 2003, the new bull market started. So by that point, I was pretty seasoned. I was a manager with a friend of mine at, at, at Sperling Enterprises, which actually was with Schoenfeld. And then um, we wound up merging with T3 as a founding partner. Not sure if T3 we founded in 2004, 2005, but it was somewhere around there. So all I know is we signed a 12-year lease, I do believe, and we just ended our lease last year. So you do the math. I don't want to get into it. It's been a long day. If you trade, you know, this action has been a little predatory. So my brain's a little fried. So <laughs> with yeah. that being said, right, uh, you know, I, 2007, 2008 hit. And uh, that is when I actually had my, my start in the media. You know, I've uh, been on CNBC we're in the media probably once a week since 2008. Greta, what year are we now? 2023. So 15 years. Yeah. 15 years of probably being in the media once a week. Not That's because great. I act like a bull or a bear, just because mm -hmm. I tell it like it is. Yeah. I don't and know. It's, and it's, it's great for people who are looking for, you know, insight from active traders who are doing this day in and day out. You're that. You're not just opining on your thoughts on the market, but you're in this action. You're doing this every single day, and that's important. Uh, quickly, for everyone that is attending, I do want to let you all know that this will be open for a Q&A session after Scott and I get through our conversation here. So if you want to go ahead and start submitting your questions in the chat, go ahead and start doing that. I will monitor that. I will go through them. We will try to answer everyone's questions as best as Scott can. So go ahead and start submitting those. All right, Scott. So I want to talk about currently what's happening. So if you had to give your week of trading so far a grade, A, B, C, D, what would that be? What would that be? Um, I'd probably say a C plus. Okay. And why? Okay, because um, I kind of know we're in a corrective phase. We've been in a corrective phase since like February 16th. If you actually, Greta, put up the chart of the spies, you'll see that on, on February 16th, I kind of went out there in, in the public and said, hey, you know, we're, we were in an active sequence long since about January 6th, and it ended on February 16th when the spies broke below 409.50. So I should know better than trying to play something that I could buy and, and actually make a higher high. So <clears throat> this week, uh, yesterday, Post earnings of NVIDIA. NVIDIA, to me, was a very strong earnings report. You can actually put up the chart of NVIDIA. Um, it's a little out of the order, out of the order, but NVIDIA had a nice move post earnings, and I like to play a post earnings gap play to figure out if there's more upside. And I tried playing it yesterday. It couldn't get through, if I remember, around 238, 239. I said I was gonna trade it today, and I wound up trading it today. And uh, I went from pretty strong to falling apart at the end of the day. So the last two days, I lost money trying to buy NVIDIA for a break above the post earnings high. And I should have known better considering I'm pretty tactical. I, I know the market's kind of pressured. We're in an active bearish sequence. So what was I thinking to try and play a stock to actually make a higher high on this week when, you know, that was January, not <laughs> February. So. I give myself a C plus, plus I was up money both days and I 
gave a bunch of it back by overtrading and thinking that I was missing out. I want you to expand a little bit more on that, on the overtrading and thinking like you were missing out. That's something that I think a lot of younger traders, inexperienced but also experienced traders like yourself, struggle with. How do you overcome that and move forward? What's your strategy for that? Well, you try and figure out what market are we in? Is there upside follow through? Is there downside follow through? Where's the oscillator? Are we overbought? Are we oversold? Are we in a choppy state? You know, are things giving you momentum? You know, what's the composure? So, you know, again, this week I kind of knew we were in a little bit of a defensive position because we were in an active sequence to the downside, but the oscillator was oversold. We were like minus 60. So I figured maybe a small little portion of strong stocks could continue to trade decently. And so they, they actually gave you some trades, but they gave you no upside follow through. So adding to a, even a strong stock for a moment you know, definitely did not work this week. So you could turn a good trade into a bad trade. Or, you know, I was long on Friday because mm -hmm. it felt like we put a short-term bottom in. And by Monday with the gap up, I wound up making pretty much what I'm happy making in a day. And then I kind of overtraded that away. And by the end of the day, it was red. And I should know better than that. Okay, so February is now officially over on Wall Street. And as you've kind of mentioned, it's been a tough month of trading after we had that really rosy January. After that, you know, December into January was pretty rosy. What was your strategy throughout the past month as that corrective action started to happen? Well, from January 6th up until early February, you got paid for holding positions in what I call a portfolio approach. I tried to be in 10 to 15 positions using my tier system, creating cash flow, holding some names to let the market make me money. And then once we got above that 4,100, I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure if we could continue or if we were going to do a false breakout because of positioning. And then once February 16th happened, when we broke back below 4,100, I tried to get tactical. I tried to reduce risk, which I did. And I actually even bought some puts, I made some money short, but still there was definitely some slippage there. So now, mm -hmm. you know, for this month, I'm in tactical mode. What's going on right now is this. Um, yields are now, um, you know, pretty much the market thinks that it will be higher for longer, which the market didn't think that was the case uh, a mm -hmm. few weeks ago. My base case was we're going to be, you know, higher rates for the end of the year, no cuts unless the S&P fell apart and fall apart to me is 3,500, not you know, just off the highs. So at this point, the Fed has to go, in my opinion, for the rest of the year. Um, first of all, they have to go like two more times to the upside and then hold it there. And I do think that these higher rates are going to filter into the consumer. We've started to see that. It's going to hurt earnings. We've already started to see that. And, you know, then all of a sudden people are going to be talking about how the PE of the S&P is too elevated. And that could create a little bit more downside over the next three months or so. So I'm going to be a little defensive. I'm going to try and pick and choose my trades like I did in 2022. I think in 2022, I was in like 95% cash for most of the year. I like to be fully invested. I like when the market's trending. I like to have 20 positions, but that's not the case. And as of right now, I'm going to be watching yields. I'm going to be watching inflation. We're kind of going data point by data point. The last four were hot. That's why we came in. So now we have to see the next set of data points and the next set of data points start, I believe, on March 10th, if I'm mm -hmm. correct, with uh, the jobs report. The, the hot jobs report was the last one that started this hot sequence of data, which created equities to the downside. So we'll see how that goes. But between now and then, it's uh, a week and a half. So first thing I'm really going to be looking at is how does the market react to Tesla's event tomorrow? Because Tesla has been a barometer of risk. If you want to, uh, Greta, show up, show Tesla yeah. on, on on the on the screen. I'm actually going to put the chart up myself. Also, I have it right here. You know, today it hit 211 ish. Um, uh, I would think as long as it holds 203 tomorrow, it's still intact. If it starts breaking below 201, 203, especially post event, then you know all of a sudden uh, this inside range breaks to the downside, and I have a feeling uh, risk will come off if. I don't know what they're going to say that could excite people after a move like we've already seen in January if all of a sudden it gets above and stays above the resistance that I showed between 214 and 217, which is also the 200 day. There's a small chance that it can go to 225 ish, and that would cause an oversold bounce into the end of the week. 
I put on some Tesla calls because I don't like to be in for a binary event. If it triggers throughout the day, I'll trade the stock. But if it comes out with some kind of news of a buyback or a $25,000 vehicle or whatever, the market wants to respond, well, I want to have a small amount of a bit on just in case. But just like earnings, I don't take stocks into earnings because anything can happen. I take options because risk is premium paid. You lead me right into my next question that about earnings. This is the last big week of fourth quarter earnings. We're pretty much done after this. Mostly focused on the retail sector this week. We already saw Target today. Uh, Lowe's is still coming. Macy's, Dollar Tree, Kroger. You got the grocery stores in there as well. What has been your strategy for this earnings season? I've been watching to see where these names were in December and early January because a lot of them had pre-earnings move. So when something has a pre-earnings move that's a big one, then it can't mm -hmm. be a horrible reporting go higher. It has to be much better than fear. If mm -hmm. you didn't go anywhere and it's trading at the dead lows, then it doesn't have to be you know, too much better than feared for it to actually go higher. So I look at where the stock was, and then I look at you know, what the report is. Sometimes I trade it after hours. Sometimes I wait till the day after. The beginning of earnings season gave us clues that the January rally could continue because if you remember, Netflix was the first real report that gapped above resistance and held it and gave you continuation. So that mm -hmm. gave a little confidence that a stock like Tesla could do it, which it did. AMD did it. Actually, Meta even did it. And then Meta actually was the first name that had a huge earnings gap that started to fill it. And that's when some risk started to dribble out. So there's lots of different ways to approach earnings season. What I will do is never take a stock into earnings because that could ruin your month and your quarter. It's a guess. Mm -hmm. If you think there's a good setup, you take options because risk is premium paid. All right. Um, so you mentioned the Tesla investor event that's uh, being hosted tomorrow. In addition to the investor event, we're getting Rivian earnings uh, today after the close. I think they did already come out. Do you expect any type of impact on Tesla from Rivian and their results? Not really. Rivian is like the tail. I talk about yeah. cycles. And I talk about when the dog is barking, <laughs> like rough, rough, rough. That's Tesla. When Tesla is loud and Tesla is barking and making moves and running fast, the tail wags. And then all the little EV names like a Rivian, a Lucid, a this or that, they could all ride its coattails. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Tesla's not going to be that affected by Lucid, you know, or Rivian. Right. But it's vice versa. Same way with AI. You know, AI has been the code word. It's been the hot term. And AI itself, the symbols, went from like 9 to 30. And mm -hmm. while that was happening, all the other little ones, the little tail that's wagging, also had some big moves. But once AI stopped barking and stopped making higher highs, the news of AI on the little ones stopped going up. So you always want to see who's the lead dog. Tesla's the lead dog. I think Rivian's down after hours. I think there's going to be more eyes on the event than how Rivian responds to tomorrow's action. Okay, um, I do see some, some questions coming in and I wanna encourage everyone to continue submitting those questions. I will ask Scott them in a bit. One I wanna get to right away though uh, is from Michael and he asked, what does RDR equal, equals 117 refer to on the Tesla chart? So he's, this is a red dog reversal and this is one of your big things. So explain what that means for Michael who maybe has never heard about a red dog reversal before. First of all, Michael, you could Google Red Dog Reversal. There's actually a page <laughs> of, of examples of all of them. So a yeah. uh, Red Dog Reversal is, is awesome. It's a way to catch a calculated trade um, defined. Usually what a Red Dog Reversal is, is when a stock comes down, like just say from 30 to 26 to 24 to 22 to just say 19, and you weren't part of that down move because you were strategic, you get out of the way. And you were like, okay, now it's down four days in a row from 32 to 19. So people think, hey, this stock's going to 10, all right? But some people say, hey, I, think I sold mine at 32 like a champ. Now it's at 19. Maybe there's an oversold bounce. So that day it breaks below 19, goes to 18, reclaims 19. All those extra shorts have to cover. Those playing it for a bounce, buy it, and then you get an oversold type of bounce, and sometimes that starts a new move. So the 117 on the chart, which was a red dog reversal, was a pivot from January 9th. So on January 13th, it looked like it was going to break below that 117, go back towards 101. Instead, 
it reclaimed 117, closed strong, and then the following day it gapped up into the into actually the the 120s and almost as high as high as 130. Mm -hmm. So a red dog reversal is a way to play a calculated trade, you know, by knowing which way the algos are trying to steal your lunch. So the pivot is the action area, the rubber match, and knowing which way it reclaims it is your way to jump on. Sometimes you can get red dog reversal tops too. And there's all different types now, you know. So um, definitely Google red dog reversal. There's a bunch of videos, a lot of examples. And we even, have, I think we even may have done a small ebook on it. Yeah, I, I do believe so. Okay, let's get to some more of these questions. Ryan asked, um, so the corrective phase from February 16th, where's the oscillator now? And some spots on SPY that you might look for about. Okay, well, the oscillator was at like minus, I think, 62 on Friday. So you had Friday's move where we came off the lows, which was uh, 393. If you want to put the SPY chart back up, if yeah, Reddit puts back the chart, you'll it's see up. that on February 24th, which was my mom's 75th birthday. <laughs> I did go to Florida that day. That was a pivot low. You had 393. That was when the oscillator was minus 62. The oscillator gets oversold at minus 40. So when something's minus 60, which is more oversold than minus 40, it's always a little bit more complicated to put on fresh shorts. You're better covering, considering, again, like I told you, February 16th, spies went below 409.50. At that point, the oscillator was like plus 50. So from plus 50 and minus 60, that down there was a better you know, spot to look a little long and cover some shorts. So you had a, a move up to 401 this week. And now the oscillator is only minus 30, so we're not as oversold. So we're kind of in no man's land where things can get more oversold or who knows. So the only pivot you have right now is 393.64. That is Friday's low. We'll see where we open up tomorrow and see, do we hold above that? Uh, do we gap up tomorrow? Who knows? New month, new flows, maybe. So that's your point of reference. We get below 393.64. The next real level doesn't happen until like 387. So... Um, we shall see. You know, I, I like to identify points of reference to figure out, do we hold them? Do we break below and stay below them? Or do we break below, get some people out, get some people short, reclaim it, and then sometimes that could turn into a red dog reversal. Okay. Um, on the topic of oscillators, Chris asked what oscillator you use and if it's proprietary or available on most platforms. Well, one is proprietary. One, I use a site. Another one is the McCullen oscillator. I think you could use the McClellan oscillator if you want to Google that and, and pretty much, you know, see it real time and it'll, it'll give you parameters on what's oversold, what's overbought. Um, and if you wanted to know what mine's doing, just ask me. A lot of people on the Alpha team all day long say, oh, what's the oscillator at? You know, if, we, if they, <laughs> I could tell when they're, they're shorting into an up move after my day counts up to four or five, oh, where are we? Are we overbought yet? Because sometimes you get to a certain spot in the oscillator and you know you'll, you'll kind of get a, a way out. Same way, if we're really, really oversold and they start buying, they want to know where the oscillator is. <laughs> so this way they know how oversold we are and how close we are, and then they could use other tactics to buy into that. But when the oscillator is like neutral, it's not really much of a tool. Just when it gets extreme in either direction, and sometimes it gets really extreme, kind of like if you go to a casino, you see a big <laughs> uh, a line or a big, a big audience around the roulette table. And why is that? Mm -hmm. Because the seven blacks have happened. So yeah. everyone's taking red. I've seen it happen where seven blocks, blacks turn into 14 and people are going to the cash machine. They're getting blown up. They're mortgaging their house because usually <laughs> it's hard to get over seven blacks and it usually goes into a red, vice versa. So same way an oscillator minus 40 is oversold, you know, but I've seen it at minus 118 at times, same way on the, on the long side. Okay, so just a reminder for everyone that the chat is open for questions. Scott has been a professional trader for well over 25 years at this point, and so he is a wealth of knowledge. Ask him your questions. Doesn't have to be about what we've talked about so far. So far, can be you know anything you want to know about trading. Our next comes from Daniel. This is more of a comment, but I'd like to get your thoughts on it. Um, he said, "Interesting close below yesterday's, yesterday's low on spy." Nvidia closed at lows after failing 238 breakout. Could be a sign of the next move to 3850 to 3900. Traders just want continuity from one day to the next. What are your thoughts on that? It's almost like I just interviewed you. What do you think about <laughs> things close? You answered your own question. Yeah, yeah, as I look at the chart and I'm like, wow, I'm like, this candle in the spies 
kind of looks like the candle that happened on February 16th when it closed below two prior lows. Today, there was enough power to close below yesterday's low. Chances are you should be more neutral to negative than neutral to positive. The mm -hmm. one thing that keeps you from getting too big to the short side today, I would think, is because sometimes you get new flows, which is tomorrow, March 1st. Sometimes when the outside is minus 35, it's hard to be so short. And you have Tesla's investor day. So I would rather be light tomorrow than super duper short in, you know, coming into tomorrow. But gun to head, you know, I hate that phrase, actually. You know. um, I would think if I had to be something, I'd be more short than long. But I still have meta overnight. Meta, you know, didn't close well, but it was strong today. So that's like my only long, really. That's an active trade versus a, a legacy position. Do you now, want to talk I, more about it. Meta? Do you want to sure. pull up that chart? Do the chart it? of Meta? Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. So I came in today. If you, if you look at the chart of Meta. I came in today, and I knew 167.66 was the low from three days ago. You kind of have a descending trend line. You also have uh, a decent amount of the earnings gap left over from 153. So it was a, it was a good setup to me. So. Um, you know, I wasn't long it overnight. I started buying it in the first five minutes on the pullback. It felt a little weird. I was a little, it was up three. I haven't been able to buy a stock up three or two and change in a while. I knew 173-ish was the level that if it cleared, shorts would cover. And P.S., it turned into a really good morning trade. And then I sold into some strength above 177. And then I wound up buying back a little bit on the pull. And I probably have a little bit too much because I got stuck in it the way it came in. But I do think it's one of the better stocks out there right now. You know, they're, they're trying to be efficient. They did a bunch of layoffs. Um, they are looking to do a subscription business to raise some more revenue. They're in the future with the metaverse. They came out that their AI is helping them, you know, with the Apple browser. So they have a lot of like, feels like good news around them and the chart is decent. So um, I'm in that one versus most other things which look very, very broken like a Google and an Amazon and a Microsoft and some of those. Okay. Our next question comes from Nathan. He said, what do you think about slippage in the M2 money supply and dangerously low personal savings rate, lower than 2008? Do you see this as a lurking economic contraction? And how does this play into your long-term trades? I love that question, Nathan. Um, <laughs> you know what, Greta, let's put up a chart of the S&P cash for the monthly. Okay. So, yep. Okay. So I, I did a chart of the S and P uh, monthly um, mm -hmm. for the first time in a while today, because a lot of people are trying to say, you know, that macro wise um, we're starting to falter. So I wanted to show, you know, if you look at the chart, I, could you see the chart? You could see how you yeah, had so. the move in the year 2000 to 1580, the move in into 2007 to 1580, and those look like big moves, right? <laughs> And then mm -hmm. we broke above 1580 in 2013, which first of all, if you look at that, that's like 13 years of a range. That if you accumulated that yeah. range as a 401k macro investor and had a great average cost, you got paid handsomely when finally we broke out above that range in March of 2013. But then you fast forward to where we peaked at 4,800 on that chart in January of 2022. That move from the pandemic lows all the way up, I wish I didn't have my little cursor there looks ginormous mm -hmm. compared to both of those major rallies that were considered historic. So this right here, in my opinion, is a historic rally. So the Fed is no longer your friend, right? No more QE. Uh, inflation is sticky. <laughs> the consumer has right. been resilient for like a year, but rates have just got here and they've stayed here. So the <clears throat> the investor is just starting to feel it now and the consumer. Even me, I try and take from my life, you know, some uh, some common sense scenarios where, and friends, I, I finally see people finally starting to watch, you know, a little bit of what they spend. And things are still expensive. I just went to my mom's 70th birthday, oh. <laughs> flights to Florida with $800. I'm going, again, I'm going away. Yes, I'm going in April. My son's in eighth grade <laughs> to Dominican Republic with four families, Two more families wanted to join, and the place is sold out. And it costs $1,800 for a ticket to get there. So people still are spending money. I also yeah. remember in 2007, 2008, there were eight, nine million people looking for work. Mm -hmm. Now there's still nine million jobs open. So the dynamics are a little crazy right now where, you know, this we're not really in a recession yet, but things 
you know, could happen pretty fast. And if you look at this chart on the on the monthly, if you look, we did a small red dog reversal. We pushed through 4,100, went to 4,195, came back in. And, you know, if this is an, like an inside wedge forming, um, chances are, if we don't hold 3764, I'm not saying we're going to get there, which is a significant amount below 3943, which was last Friday's low, you know, you can see more. So I have multiple, multiple accounts, which I've done over many times in Red Oral Access and in Alpha Team. And some of you guys follow what I call the blood on the street account. My blood on the street account is my wife's account that started. Actually, this is a good lesson because my wife started working at UMDNJ in 2004. In 2004, mm -hmm. the S&P was like, I don't even know, 1,200. She started putting in monthly money every single month. And then all of a sudden, the financial crisis happened in 2007, 2008. She didn't pull out. I had friends who thought they were, they were cute. They pulled out of the market long term. And they missed the whole decline from 2007 all the way to the bottom of March of 2009. But they never got back in. Mm -hmm. And we went to 4,800. So my yeah. wife, not that smart, every single month put in money, every month. Mm -hmm. And then PS, she kept doing it. We took out 1580 in 2013. We went to as high as 2200. And then my wife went into private practice and they said, you can no longer have a state funded long term account and contribute to. So that became my wife's blood on the street account. But that account got built during the financial crisis. So now I use that for purely crazy opportunities to, to leg into the market to net money. So a lot of people know in 2018, I legged in three times. In 2020, I legged in four times. And then last year, I legged in twice, two different times. And then now it's sitting in cash. So people are like, when are you going to put your blood in the street account to work? And right now, I don't have it to work. So if you look at the chart here, if M2 money supply continues to constrict, if consumers start to feel it, if earnings continue to go lower, if we go into a recession, a lot of ifs, which have a high probability to be, you know, unfortunately to say, then chances are, you know, we could see 37.64. We could see the lows of of last year, and then who knows, maybe even lower. Mike Wilson says 3,200. So for that account, I'm going to space it out into three or four buys because I can't put contributions in. So I'm going to time it because I'm a market timer, and I'm going to let you know when I'm doing it so you can do it too. So that's one account. My other account, which is my own 401k, monthly flows every month. She's a 403b for a private practice every month. My son's in eighth grade. Okay, for, for college, five twenty every single month. So long term, if you're a lawyer, a doctor, a fireman, a policeman, and you're watching this, you know what? Just put money in SP every single month. Okay. If you're trying to be cute and time the market and you think they may be going lower, then these are your three levels. 39.43 last Friday's low, 37.64, 34.91, and then 3,200. They're all on there. And I'm gonna only wait for extremes. I usually buy I could buy four tiers. So far, we haven't been extreme enough for me to buy more than two. So if that's the case, that's the case. If we get to the two or to the four, I want to make sure I powder dry just in case all these experts I keep calling for some craziness in the next six months to 12 months, I have powder dry besides just my long-term inflows. And then actively, which is what we do here, I'm going to make sure if we're below the 821 day like we were last year, or even ARC, if you remember ARC, they got annihilated yeah. in 2021, we're going to be out of the way. We're going to test levels using that RDR that I showed you. We're going to try and short bounces and we're going to tell and just be careful and and just wait wait it out cash is a position if you're active you don't need to be in everything you need to know what you can handle um okay so i want to talk a little bit more about since we're on the topic of economy recession all of that the fed and your thoughts about the fed you mentioned earlier you see two more rate hikes this year holding through the end of the year that's what the fed has pretty much said they're going to do but the latest conversation that we're hearing from Fed officials is we might need to do another 50 basis point hike at the next meeting. Now, CME Group's Fed Watch still shows 25 basis points is what the, the market is expecting. Where are you personally on what the Fed might do in three weeks? I think they're going to go another quarter and then maybe go another quarter. I don't know okay. why they would all of a sudden go to 50. It also depends where the market is, right? Yeah. By the time of the next Fed meeting, if we're bounced and we're back above you know, 4,000, 4,040, they'll say, hey, the market's being queued. Maybe we can go 50. If we're down near 3,900 and we're still, you know, 6% off the highs from early February, chances are they'll do a quarter so they don't, you know, cause some kind of dislocation. Mm -hmm. But I do still think they have to go more and they have to keep it higher for longer. That's the whole thing. They'll get to their ceiling and then it's how long are they going to keep it there? So this way it slows 
the consumer down and just slows the economy down. So this way it brings prices down. That's what they want. They want to slow. They want to wring out the excess. They want to wring out a decade of interest rates way too low and free money that the Washington gave out because of the pandemic in 2020 and 2021. And, you know, unfortunately, it's a process that has to happen, you know, and cycles happen. And we have to make sure that we don't get um, frustrated. We don't get, um, what's the word? Just, you know, just kind of like we don't lose our cool. It's easy to lose your cool in this market and then you lose money for no reason. And then that slippage happens that your other uh, guest was talking about. So at this point, I do think they're going to go at least a quarter. If they go a half, we'll see what happens. I would think that the knee jerk reaction would be lower. Yeah. Um, yeah. And at this point, so lower is not so bad. Get it out mm -hmm. of the way so it doesn't suck in new money and let let it happen faster than sooner. And that's the problem is we're all a little spoiled because, you know, <laughs> if you look at the move that happened in 2020, look how fast that down move happened and look how fast we reversed back up. Mm -hmm. This has been slow and down and predatory. Yeah. The computers are trying to make everyone feel as bad about themselves as possible so then they can make their money. Um, our next question comes from Josh. He asked, what are your views on trading versus investing in crypto over the next three to five years? If you're going to invest in crypto, I would only invest in Bitcoin and maybe okay. Ethereum. You know, okay. invest in Bitcoin, put in monthly flows, just like an S&P fund. And I mm -hmm. think overall, over time, Bitcoin is going to be around for, you know, for, I don't know, forever, but for a long time. And Ethereum also. But, but you don't see any need for active like trading in crypto at this point? You could trade Bitcoin also. I traded mm -hmm. it this year. I bought it in January when Bitcoin was like at 17 and 18. I sold it at 21. I bought it back and I sold it at 23. But if you're investing, the only thing I think that's investable between us is Bitcoin and Ethereum. If you're going to trade, you could trade altcoins too. But you mm -hmm. know, I would think 90% of altcoins are going to be zeros. So don't invest in altcoins. Don't invest in, you know, I sort of like people who were living and dying by SOL or living and dying by, you name it, even Luna before the debacle or FTX. Yeah. So don't put a lot of money in altcoins. If you're going to put money for the long term and you think it's for the long term, just go with Bitcoin or Ethereum. Okay. Our next question comes from Kartik. He said, what according to you is a good time to enter when market moving news comes in? He says, I've noticed that whenever I enter a sentiment analysis based trade, the volatility usually takes me to deep losses when using margin first and then moves to green. Sometimes it also happens that it starts marching to the green area. Um, he gave an example of trading options on index event days slash releases. The bottom line is the computers are faster than you. There are algos that mm -hmm. scrape word sequences well before you even see it. So before uh, a sentiment traded move happens or a news you know um, created event happens um, the fast money already happens so what you probably should do is before you get sucked in take a deep breath let it pull in a little bit give you a point of reference and your first buy will probably be the wrong buy and then the next buy will be the right guy buy and then use your retracement rules if something goes up just say four dollars fast and it's mm -hmm. really going to be up eight dollars it probably doesn't pull in more than a dollar if something was up four dollars fast, and then you buy it, at, uh, you know, only up three, and then you buy it only up two, and then it's only up one. Chances are, it should never have been up four dollars, and there's no real volume there. You also look at the volume; you need volume to continue. If something that's traded based on news happens, it's got to come out with like a five-minute volume bar, and then it has to continue to have that rate of volume thereafter to support prices to continue it. So the first move is usually a move that happens fast by the computers. What you should do is wait a little bit, let it come in a little bit, settle, and then you buy it and then you watch the volume. And then he also had a second question. Do VIX, DXY, the dollar index, and SPX divergence work on shorter time frames? Not really. I think the okay. VIX is built to fail. VIX does reverse, uh, <laughs> reverse um, what's it called, uh, splits, and it's built mm -hmm. to go to zero. Um, the VIX right. isn't the VIX that people think. Um, People like, oh, the VIX is low. I'm going to buy it. Doesn't mean it's a buy. If, you know, you only get two or three spikes in the VIX. You know, each year, if that. Um, and most people make more money shorting it because it's all short-lived. So I would not be basing your trades on the VIX. Maybe the U.S. dollar. You know, when the U.S. dollar is a threshold, the U.S. dollar has become a, a 
uh, instrument that people look at to, to program their trades. So for a while when the dollar was going up, computers were programmed to sell the S&P. When dollar was going down, it was you know, programmed to buy. The same way when yields are up, programmed mm -hmm. to sell. But those correlations change also. So correlations always change. It depends on what the market is over-focusing on and what the narrative is. Um, but as far as the VIX, I wouldn't use it as a vehicle to hedge. And if you you know, have a big call spread on three months out, every three months, you might catch it once or twice, but it's, it's something that I would just be very careful with. You mentioned yields, and right now we have this extremely, extremely inverted yield curve. The two-year is way higher than the 10-year, and it's been that way for quite a while now. Everyone says that's a signal of a recession to come, but we still don't have technically a recession at this point. We have, as you mentioned, a really strong labor market. People are still spending. What do you, where do you, what are your thoughts on the inverted yield curve and what it means for the market right now? You know, I know I think about it in the back of my mind, but it's not basing my decisions on, you know, it's in my mm -hmm. mind telling me that, hey, maybe a recession could happen, but um, some people think that's a broken situation also. But, um, you know, it just depends when. Everyone in the world said the recession was going to happen in the first half of this year, and we rallied and they knocked their teeth out in January. Yeah. It was much better to use the 8 21 day and watch charts and look at the professionals who said, hey, look at the yield curve, get short. You know what? If you shorted, it was hard to stay solvent and stay with the trade. So although the they say the bond market is right, and it might be at some point, it's not a timing mechanism. It's just something to think about as a coincidental indicator and trade what's in front of you. Look at the, the reaction to earnings, the reaction to events, the reaction of the leaders, what moving averages are we above? And then in the back of your mind, think about the macro backdrop. Right now, the macro backdrop is definitely challenged and that's why you can't even if you are love and you're loving the long side you have to be a little careful because um it might just be a, a sentiment you know induced move but at yeah. this point because too many people are short because of the yield curve but then something happens and no one expected and then it runs but i would say the yield it's definitely a little bit concerning you know we should slow down in the next three to six months common sense wise rates where they are now for longer is definitely going to slow down spending for instance, my wife has a lease, a car that she had three years ago. The same exact car that she had three years ago on a lease is now $400 more. Mm -hmm. So what did she do? She extended the lease six months and setting a new car just to see what happens. So yeah. I'm saying that's like normal life. Right. So you, you think about common sense and you think about slowdowns and then all of a sudden the mechanicals, you know, wind up coming to an equilibrium. Um. The latest piece of data we got today was consumer confidence from the conference board and a big focus for the latest for the most recent consumer confidence readings has been on the expectations index that dropped to a seven month low of 67.9. So we're further below what most consider kind of a recession threshold of 80. We're dropping further below that. So that would be an indication that we're probably going to be in a recession in six months to 12 months. At least that's what consumers expect to happen. Also, inflation expectations, although a little bit better, consumers still say they see inflation at 6.3% annually a year from now. That's some hot inflation. And if you look at a year from now, people are hoping that the Fed might start cutting rates in 2024. Where do you fall in that little I would say mix of things? <laughs> you know, again, that's a cautionary flag. You know, but again... Markets have to manipulate the action in order to get the real people out. So sometimes they induce little rallies to distribute stock before things go lower. Mm -hmm. What you just stated, I think, sounds very true. I don't mm -hmm. think that they're going to cut rates anytime in 2023 mm -hmm. unless, unless China invades Taiwan or they send weapons to, to Russia to fight the Ukraine and then things go haywire and the market falls 15% in six weeks. I don't think there's a shot in you know, sugar, honey, iced tea, hell that they cut rates. They have to keep it higher for longer. So I would think in 2024, maybe because the, the consumer is getting hurt, earnings are going lower, we're getting negative GDP, we're going into a recession, and the Fed got what they wanted. Right now, the mm -hmm. Fed doesn't have what they want. They're not even close. Right. Uh, our next question comes from John. He asked, what is your favorite time frame with favorite strategy? You know, I like to look at daily charts. Right. And mm -hmm. see what things are working, where the setup is. And then usually, depending on the market and the, like the futures, 
um, if they're up or they're down in the morning and I use my daily charts and my pivots and I like to see uh, so like some kind of action area where like a strong stock closes well, maybe the futures are down because of something happened in China or Europe and that stock that was strong is lower. And then my favorite set setup is to buy that red to then go, you know, go green and then maybe even go higher than where I thought it would be higher if we were in a normal market. So I like taking advantage of over emotion using daily charts and looking for signals in the first 30 minutes of relative strength to relative weakness in order to add cash flow to that trade. Okay, and a good question from Joseph here. He asked you to tell us about the T3 culture and the steps that new traders at T3 should look forward to in order to become a profitable trader. Well, I would say the T3 culture to me is awesome. Like I have the mm -hmm. Alpha team, usually there's four to 500 people on there and everyone's just trying to share their expertise. Some guys trade bios and are listing different events with different data and they're experts and they try and give out some, some good advice and clues. Some guys trade the financials and they're always watching yields and they're watching this. You know, everyone has their own expertise and I feel like it's, it's one of those things where it's like uh, 400 eyeballs are better than two. Um, right. If some kind of news comes out, boom, it's there. If I ask a question because I'm busy, I have six monitors, I'm talking to Fox Business or this or that, I'm like, hey, you know, what, what's, the, what's the earning state of that? Or what was the news here? Boom, it's like my own think tank. And they're all really seasoned traders, so they're posting it there before I have to go look for it. So everyone mm -hmm. helps each other and everyone feels good if they're right. Nobody wants to be wrong. You know, everyone wants to say, hey, great call, great call. Today I was in Meta in the first hour of the day, and a lot of people made really good money. So it felt good that not only I made money, they made money. So, right. you know, that that's, I feel like the culture of the alpha team is that everyone tries to help each other. It's not like in a brokerage firm, you know, where I've had friends where they get, uh, you know, a, a billionaire on the phone and they open up an account and he sends them half a million, half a billion or just say $20 million. And then the other guy is like jealous because the other guy landed a big account. No, if you're mm -hmm. a trader, you could both trade the same stocks as enough liquidity. And if you're both right in direction, you could both make as much money as you're comfortable making and high five each other. You're not stealing each other's lunch. You could both play trade Tesla. You could trade Meta. You could trade Google, whatever it is when there's a good setup and there's no competition. It's just everyone helping each other and, and pointing things out. So that's what I love about this job is that there's room for everyone to succeed. And when you have a don't trade alone uh, mentality, um, the alpha team really, to me, is fantastic. I think all the rooms at T3 are the same way. Yeah, and mm -hmm. if anyone is sarcastic and anyone beats somebody else up, they're getting one strike and three strikes, they're out. I don't care, you know, the subscription payment, this and that. If somebody's, you know, fluffing feathers and being a jerk, I'm just going to get rid of them. I don't need them. Same way I, I, on, on, on Twitter, I probably block eight or nine people a day, you know, because I just don't need them in my life. Outside of Alpha Team, uh, just talk a little bit about the culture of being a professional trader with T3 Trading Group. Because as people join T3 Trading Group, they do get access to the Alpha Team and some other rooms with T3 Live. Uh, but just talk about that culture and what it's like working with other professional traders. I just think, you know, other professional traders are great guys. They all have great karma. Like, <laughs> mm -hmm. they, they all try and do the right thing because they don't want anything bad to happen to them when they're trading. They don't want bad news happening to something when they're overnight. They don't want good news happening. They just want things to go and have some kind of continuity and play by the rules. As a trader, we have like this good book and a set of rules that things should happen, you know, according to this arena. And they don't want things to go wrong. How could something go wrong if you act like a bad person? You know, you right. yell at the trader across, you bang your keyboard, you know, you blame someone else for a bad trade. So I feel like traders, you know, use a lot of karma. Not not they don't hope and wish and pray for things to happen. They just want things to happen based on their process and nothing to interrupt it. And they don't want to do anything to interrupt it. So all they want to do is do good things around them to create a nice halo. So, you know, so when opportunity meets preparation, you get a little luck versus a smack in the tush. All right, we have a few more questions to get to. Everyone watching, go ahead and submit your questions now so we can make sure that Scott answers them for you. While we're on this topic of T3 and the culture at T3, uh, Joshua asked, what's T3's gamble and expectations of new traders? What should new traders focus on for consistency? I'll just keep it simple. You know, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a long process if you're a new trader. If you were going to graduate from college and become a lawyer, how many years does it take you to become a lawyer? 
<laughs> I don't know. Mm -hmm. it, I don't know. Is it four better? What is it? I don't remember. Like to be a lawyer, you I'm probably sure. have to go to law school for four years and spend another half a million dollars to practice law. So yeah. coming out of college, if you want to be in the financial markets, why do you think within three, six, nine, 12 months, you're going to be making six figures? You have to mm -hmm. pay your dues there as well. My wife's a neuropsychologist. It took her seven years before she could actually make money and then she owed six figures. Mm -hmm. So just don't expect it so fast. Just learn, you know, simplify it, lose less in the beginning so you don't have to make it back when you finally get it. And mm -hmm. then be slow and steady and, and work on your process. And everyone's process is different. Something make, you know, everyone has something that makes them tick. Some people like to be short. Some people like to be long. Some people love to play breakouts. Some people only want to be intraday. Some people only want to trade pre-market. Some people want to trade futures. So, you know, but for the beginning part, just watch how things move and learn a lot about technical analysis, learn a lot about charts. And I think Sammy's, uh, uh, he has, a, I know he's got, um, Trading the pristine method. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I took that in 2000. I think I took that in 2000, 2001 when I was over at Broadway Trading. I took it with the owner then, Greg mm -hmm. Capra, and I learned a lot. And I still remember it. You know, bar by bar analysis. What do candlesticks mean? It kind of gives you some rules to trade actively. So, you know, Sammy's mm -hmm. course I think is something that every new trader should take, as well as my path to profits, and one or the other, or take both. Whatever it is, I think T3 you know, does uh, advocate for both of them. And and just also then don't do too much. Don't overthink it. Right. You know, get in the moment, trade, and just, you know, just try and have some success and success breeds success. John asked, what are your thoughts on coin after today's move and SI in the same sector with recent large investor fillings? Let me see. It was... Coin was today stronger than other things, and I wasn't sure why. It wasn't like Bitcoin had a big move. Um, yeah. You know, I, if I could post a chart, I would post coin, and coin broke its little descending trend line and reclaimed the moving averages. Coin hit a high of just say 67.50. Um, what I would call this is like a day one. Usually okay. on a day one, okay, this is a good lesson actually. A day one happens where there's a day one igniting bar of a new potential move. So what usually would happen on a day two. Either you get upside follow through. So just say you took 500 shares of coin home. Maybe it opens up $2. You sell some and hold some. If, because it was up so much today, the futures are down. If it's going to act special, it should hold at least 50% of today's move tomorrow. And you should be able to buy it to go from red to green. Buy it in the hole. This is one of my favorite tactics, which someone asked me about. Like just say it's down a dollar, goes green, pushes up. You then sell what you bought in the hole, and then you keep your existing position. And then if it happens to get above today's high tomorrow, tomorrow, then you can even add to that. So right. today in coin, if it's any good, it, it it should hold a decent amount of today's move. And and it was a day one, and the whole sector kind of moved. You know, SI didn't move actually because someone pointed out coin, and SI didn't break above it. And and someone pointed out square, which is block, looks like something I'd watch tomorrow. Like if coin gets followed through tomorrow then maybe square is something that follows coin a day behind. So when sectors are in play, you want to see all four or five different stocks in that sector. And right now, like I mentioned before, the dog's got a bark for the tail to wag and coin is basically the the, the, the head of it. It's actually really Bitcoin is, but coin yeah. and part is equities. Uh, Nathan asked, how much do global factors play into your trades? For example, Chinese markets with Alibaba. Every morning I wake up at around 4.30. First thing mm -hmm. I do is look at what happened in Europe, what happened in Asia. If okay. Europe's down 1% or so, or Asia's down 1.5%, I think to myself, where should the S&P futures be based on the day before? So this is 4.45, and at this point, I'm probably in my sauna. And then I'll look at the S&P futures and just say, they would probably be down 15 handles. If Europe's down a percent and Asia's down 1.5%, chances are global markets are having you know, weakness. Question is, were we weak the day before? So are they following us? Were we strong the day before? And we're following them. So it all depends on who's leading what and what's happening. But I always look at what's happening overseas in the morning to see how it dictates dictates the, the futures action. And then if, you know, Europe and Asia are both down and we're up a decent amount, I'm like, okay, there's got to be some news domestically to have us up if overseas is down. 
So I definitely look at them every day. It's not, you know, black and white as far as, um, you know, what has to happen, but I look to see if there's divergences and I look to see, you know, what, what narrative are we in. Right now, you know, Asia went from strong two months ago to back under pressure because of, I don't know, them maybe giving weapons to Russia, the balloon scandal, but but the, 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 the Asian markets have been weaker lately and I don't give them much attention. I've been, I've been giving more attention to Europe because we've been kind of okay. playing in, in lockstep and Europe's yeah. been stronger than us. Okay. Uh, Kartik asked, what's the one sector that you are bullish on and the one sector you are confidently bearish on given the new data coming in today and the economy in general? I'm not overly bullish on everything and I'm kind of actively bearish on the S&P. Okay. I think energy sector that people were hiding in in 2021 and 2022 looks very vulnerable. I think the banks that are supposed to be so strong because of rates aren't showing any upside momentum. I think not every tech stock is created equal. It's very a stock specific setup oriented environment until we get to a lower level that the market could have a real active sequence long like it had, you know, and it's right now not there. So um, I wouldn't try and be so sophisticated and talk to me like you talk to me on TV where it says, oh, what sector do you love best right now? You know, <laughs> if the S&P is going to 32 or 3,000, every sector is going to go down. Yeah, One sector go down a little less than another. You might as well have cash as a position, especially as a, as a trader. You mentioned the energy sector and Nathan wanted to get your thoughts there. Uh, so expand a little bit more what you what you're feeling about nuclear, solar, hydrogen, the energy sector, you know, as a whole right now. Well, you just named lots of different sectors. Yeah. <laughs> Chevron, today, Chevron announced a, a more of a dividend and the buyback it opened up two bucks went red. That's not bullish action. Are you okay. seeing kind of sorry to interrupt, but there's interrupt. there's your old energy sector, which is oil. Yep. Through all of that, Chevron, Exxon, all those guys, those players. And then you have your renewable energy sector, nuclear, solar, hydrogen. Do you see those two sectors behaving differently in the stock market in the years ahead? Or not the years, but- Old energy's rolling over. Old energy was like a value sector the past two years while they sold right. growth. So I do think at some point growth is gonna take over again. Hydrogen, solar, fuel cell, it's gonna, it has to be the wave of the future, it's just a matter of when. Yeah. And, um, you know, the, you know, since 2001, when the ARC, you know, fund blew up with Kathy Wood, everything that was unprofitable and, and you know, pie in the sky, that was, you had to own for three years turned into you had to sell. Last mm -hmm. two years, you had to own value because they were making so much money. Now, it does look like the XLE, Oxy, CVX, you know, they all look kind of like they're rolling over and oil came in a lot. I guess if China comes online, maybe consumption and oil can go back up. You know, if the war in the Ukraine ends anytime soon, maybe that'll create some demand or, or not. Maybe that means that every, the pipes will open up. At this point, XLE does not look good. Solar, um, FSLR came after the close. I don't know what it's doing, but it's sloppy to me also. Um, yeah, you know, like ENPH is, is broken. Nothing really looks so good, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Concept stocks are, con are, are only concept stocks until the market makes them, you know, a market leader. And right now, solar stocks are not market leaders. Fuel cell stocks are market leaders. You know, the old school energy used to be, and now they're rolling over. It's kind of more of a, of a defensive position for now, unless you really have some kind of base case and you have an opinion and you, you have no time frame and you're going to just let it happen, which to me that, that causes bad investments because that's what people thought they could do for the last year and a half. Mm -hmm. Louise said, Scott, you keep mentioning the computers when it comes to anticipating moves and how we cannot beat them. How do you play around? By the way, you moves? can beat them. You can beat them. You just need to, be prepared. You need to know what they're doing. That's what the red book reversal does for you. Right. So that's, that's his question. How do you how do you play around moves that cannot be fabricated by the retail crowd on days with news? How about days without news? Whose news do you pay attention to? You, if there's days that knows no news, you just look at the action, look at what's happening in each sector. Do we open lower? And if all sectors are red, which sector goes first fast, you know, mm -hmm. and turns green, mm -hmm. and then maybe the futures come up, and that's the sector that leads for the day. Maybe if we open up like we opened up on Monday, the first sector that goes red, and the and the spies are still up 15 handles, you know, we go to red. That first sector that went red is going to be a lot lower. So you look at just the action. So I have one set of screen, you know, a screen that has all these market views that shows me every sector so I can see a snapshot of what's happening in the morning 
And then as the morning develops, I could see where the relative weakness is, where the relative strength is, and then figure out if I want to be involved or not. Um, if you have a big binary event, you better keep risk down because anything can happen. It feels like mm -hmm. the last year, every binary event's been big, whether it's the CPI, the PPI, the jobs report, the Fed, and, and, and lately, <laughs> It does the opposite of what the consensus thinks. Yeah. Eddie said he noticed that a previous question, you mentioned options on the index volatility crush on the major economic events. What is your favorite option strategy under the current uncertain market conditions? Well, I tend to use option strategies a lot when we're overbought or oversold. If we're really overbought, what I usually do, which is very a little risky for newer traders is I sell premium. Like mm -hmm. if the spies go up for five days and the oscillators plus 60, I'll sell spy calls naked, but I would have also shorted the spies right there. So if just say the spies are at 401, like they were on Monday and people are like, oh, well, we're in a bear market. I'm just going to short the spies of 401. I would say, hey, let's short the 403s. This way we have $2 a room and we can get $1.40 for it for two days from now. So sometimes when we get an extreme move or I'm looking to be short, I'll short premium. So it gives me more room. That's one way I use options. Another way is in earnings. Um, you know, if I think there's a great setup, I can't take the stock along with short. I'll buy calls or, or buy a call spread or buy puts or buy a put spread. And I use options to define my risk if I have a thought process on a certain situation. Our next question comes from, sorry, I'm scrolling through these, John, and he asked if you use or have a favorite hedging strategy. Favorite what strategy? Hedging. Usually if I'm in like 10, 12 positions and the market's overbought, like I just said before, I'll short SPY premium higher, where okay. I wouldn't mind getting short the SPYs if we get there. So mm -hmm. sometimes if I short the SPY premium higher and it gets there, the premiums out and then they, and if it goes above that strike, they short it to me. But that by that point, we'd be super duper overbought. And then, you know, and then I, I'll get shorted and then I'll give it a day and I usually make money on the hedge and, you know, hopefully sell them strength with the positions that I have. And then sometimes if, if I feel like we're going to go down and I want to make more than just premium, you know, I'll buy sets of puts and, I'll, and then if we go lower, I'll turn it into a put spread. But I rarely, you know, hedge with like the VIX and with... Okay currencies and stuff like that. I'm not that sophisticated. I'm a very simple guy. Uh, we talked about NVIDIA earlier and I've had you wrapped up here. So Daniel pointed out that NVIDIA filed a $10 billion offering after the close. And there's been some, some discussion here as, as that might be why NVIDIA is down on after oh. hours. So if you want to talk about that, give your thoughts. This is kind of like a, a look at what discussions can be like in the why. ETF. Yeah. So anyway, I'm not long thoughts, the video. I was long the video today. And thank goodness I got out of it. Yeah. Um, I got out of it. Why? Because it fell $4 as if sellers took over. And I was, my trade changed. I was like, I'll be along the video at 234. And if it gets I'm going to pull up the chart for everyone. Just so if okay. you want to reference it, but I know there's a big after hours move. So it might not matter. <laughs> if you look at the chart in the video, you know, there's a, a gap there from earnings 230. Sometimes mm -hmm. these earnings gaps hold and then give you a continuation move. I, like I told you before, I gave myself a C plus in the week because I was trying to buy 236 to 238 to play to 242. And then today, it, if you look at this last candle, it wound up closing on its lows below 234. Thank goodness that got me out because for me, I was, you know, kind of had FOMO of missing a move to the upside and missing that momentum. And instead, it closed below it. So I had no reason actively to be long it. It, my, my, my reason changed, and thank goodness, because if this would have closed strong and closed around 238, 239, um, you know, I would be in this few thousand shares and I'd be down seven points and I'd be pissed off right now and probably say, I'm, <laughs> I'm leaving, I'll be back you know, tomorrow. But anyway, <laughs> now it's below 230 and um, the eight day is like 225 or 226, so you'd have to deal with it. Some people, though, I'll, I'll be honest, some people are probably long at verse 230 because that's the you know, the post earnings gap. And if you are, I, I, I can't tell you did the wrong thing, except for hopefully if he traded with a tier system, he had less than if we looked really strong today. Okay. Let me look what Met is doing because I'm long some Met over and I bet you it's bringing it down. Mm -hmm. not, too, not too bad. When you would expect that NVIDIA drag to drag on the cues as well, right? A little bit. You know, it is a, it is a, um, a shelf. So it's not like 
NVIDIA is lowering their earnings guidance or, right. or something fundamentally, they're just raising money while their stock is, I guess, the rates are where they are. Mm -hmm. Well, ultimately, it's not a great. Um, but it seems like the street knew, somebody knew, because yep. the way it was trading at one o'clock and two o'clock was different than the way it was trading at three and four. That's why you watch the price action, because everybody always knows something. And, uh, you know, someone knew that this was, uh, you know, because what they do is when you have place a shelf, they shop it around to major institutions. So somebody, these institutions were calling on their phone to the buy side saying, hey, guys, there's mm -hmm. a shelf coming. Not that I've ever gotten that phone call. I don't have a phone <laughs> on my desk. But uh, for I, saw, this Wall Street. I saw an interesting tweet from you yesterday. And I want to talk about it a little bit. You uh, were tweeting that you about things you like about the market. And you said you love stock buybacks. You got some pushback from people saying they don't like stock buybacks. Why do you like stock buybacks? What do they mean for the market? What do they mean for a company doing it? Explain. It means that the company believes in its, I guess, in itself somewhat and doesn't see better use for their money elsewhere. If they did, they'd be buying another company that they thought was undervalued. So maybe they think them, their, their own company's undervalued. I yeah. guess I like it also because you know, mechanically and trading wise, I could see sometimes like you could have a down open in the futures and all of a sudden buyback machines usually turn on around 947, 950. So maybe you can make some cash flow buying Apple that usually has a big buyback or buying Microsoft or some of these mega caps. So it gives you ways to make cash flow if you understand the mechanics of the situation. Mm -hmm. I just like also, I said, I like free enterprise. I said, I like capitalism and mm -hmm. companies should not be, you know, scrutinized for using their own cash to buy their own stock to create shareholder value for their investors. Who the hell is watching this and tell them what they can and cannot do? They just mm -hmm. want to get their, their pocketbooks fleeced by taxing them so then they could do whatever the hell they do. Just saying, I'm not trying to try to talk <laughs> politics or anything, but, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> uh, Ryan said, Scott, it seems like you trade things that you know something about the company, what they do, news, and so on. But some traders deal in tickers and admit that they don't even know the company name or what it does. Do you ever trade like that? I do have a go-to list. It's a very good observation. My go-to mm -hmm. list usually is pretty similar all year round, but then every now and then some things that start acting like sugar, honey, iced tea come off the go-to list because they act bad and they don't deserve to be there. Some things stay, some new sectors come on. I learn how they move. I learn how, what they look like, what they feel like. So when they give me a signal, I can, you know, sink my teeth into it. So my go-to list is like my bread and butter. Every now and then the Alpha team will bring me a situation and say, oh my God, look at the 250% of the volume in the first three minutes of the, of the part of the day. I'll, I'll quickly look at the chart to day one. I'm like, eh, I'll try that too. Because sometimes volume ignites a situation. So those are where I don't make a living on, but every now and then if you catch one, it's fun and it can make you money. But typically I make the majority of my money having my go-to list, charting them every morning, knowing my levels, knowing how they feel, knowing what to expect. So this way I have conviction in what I do and then when they're properly set up, I could really add my to my tier size and knock the ball over the fence. But if I don't know what I'm trading, I don't know much about it. I don't know where it's been. I don't know what it looks or feels like. It's hard for me to trade it for more than a small amount of shares to make some, you know, some insignificant money. Okay, Scott, we're going to wrap things up here for everyone that is attend that's still here in the chat. I have just posted a link for our next event that will be in just. A little over two weeks from now, March 15th, Scott's counterpart, Dan, Dan Darrow, will be joining me on that, uh, that event. Uh, he runs the Alpha Team BTF alongside Scott, and Dan is an options specialist. So we'll be talking Ooh. a lot. Yeah, he knows so much about options. So He's also our, really good with bios, too. He's a really good, does his homework on bios. Like every trader has a niche. Like mine is like me mega cap techs, uh, semi, you know, uh, semis. The, the indices, he knows his bios. He knows a lot more than that too, but I'm saying, you know, every different trader has their own really sweet spot and his sweet spot does really well with bios too. He does. Okay, so everyone, if you want to register for that event, I did post the link. I don't know if you can click it. I can't tell by how I'm looking at it, but I know you can at least copy paste it. That will be on March 15th. Please join us for that. And again, Scott is a professional trader with T3 Trading Group and he runs the Alpha Team Virtual Trading Floor with t3 live if you want to work with scott just type alpha team btf into your to your google search bar and it will come up and you can join you can work with scott and ask him these questions like we've had here 
every single day. He's there to talk to you as long along with the other moderators in the room. So yeah, usually I have, I have this on. And you get to see Scott's trades in real time. So this positions yeah. disclosure that I have here at the bottom of our screen, that's changing as Scott is buying stocks all day long in the BTF in real time. So you can see all of that. Okay, thank you so much, Scott, for joining us for this event. And Thanks, everyone Scott. at home, I hope you enjoyed. Thank you. I appreciate it. Have a happy, happy Tuesday. Good yeah, luck tomorrow. happy Tuesday. Good luck tomorrow with the start of a new month of trade. Yes, Scott. let's see if some new flows come in and we'll figure it out. Okay. Audio. Bye, everyone. Adios.